enjoy the lecture on the practical aspect. Um, so I'm going to discuss winning from mechanical ventilation, with, which is a very vast topic, uh, but very important because it concerns every patient under mechanical ventilation, and also because this is probably the part where you can have the greatest impact on the reduction of the duration of mechanical ventilation. Uh, so I've been working with a number of uh, uh, companies uh, for clinical research project or, or equipment, and they are listed here. So the history of winning is, is a very young history. Uh, this, this is the two first uh, multicenter randomized control trials uh, performed in winning from mechanical ventilation, comparing different <coughs> modes. So uh, this is the one we published in 1994, and we compared three different approaches to winning. One very important point is that uh, we only selected patients for this study uh, who had uh, failed their first attempt at separation from the ventilator, so their, their first spontaneous breathing trial. And just after failing, they were enrolled, and we compared three different techniques, SIMV, TPs with a gradual uh, increase in the duration, and pressure support. And uh, the, the next year, a, a, a similar study performed in Spain by Andres Esteban also compared four different techniques, uh, including uh, once daily or several intermittent TP trials. So this uh, result uh, started some confusion about winning. In fact, the, the first result of these two trials were very similar. Because the first result was that depending on which technique you use, which approach you use, uh, there is a huge impact on the duration of mechanical ventilation. You see, for instance, in our study, uh, if you take like at, uh, at seven days, uh, in one arm, you have still 50% of patients who are still on the ventilator, whereas with another approach, you have only 20%. So it's a big difference, and the results were the same in the two studies. And that was at that time uh, uh, a big surprise, because it, it uh, basically said, well, winning, it's not only the patient improving, it's a lot about the process and what we do to separate the patient from the vent. Uh, the, the second result, which was uh, similar, was that we selected patients who failed their first winning attempt, and that was approximately 25% of the total population. And that was the same in the two studies. What was different was that the results were not the same. We found that pressure support ventilation was the most efficient technique. Whereas in uh, Est Andres Esteban study, pressure support looked bad because it looked like uh, SIMV as the worst technique, and they found that once daily TP trial was the best approach. So this created a lot of confusion. I do think that there is a very simple explanation. The explanation is that the way pressure support was used was very different in the two arms, in the two studies, sorry. Uh, we, we let the patients have a respiratory rate up to 35 before changing the pressure support level, whereas in uh, Andres Esteban's study, every time the respiratory rate was above 25, uh, they increased the pressure support level which increased the duration of the winning and mechanical ventilation. So this is very important to remember. For instance, if you want to apply pressure support as a winning technique, uh, I don't think you should use this approach where every time you have a respiratory rate above 25, you increase the level. And in fact, we know now that this high level of pressure support are associated with a lot of asynchrony. Uh, so, 
this was just to illustrate the fact that there is a lot of, of confusion. And if, if you look at the literature about winning, you will find all kind of uh, questions discussed. And for this reason, uh, this consensus conference published in 2007 tried to uh, put a, a schema, a general schema, on what are the general problems in winning. And the description of winning was to say that you have three groups of patients. The first group, it's simple. Uh, winning is simple, which means at the first attempt, the patient is separated from the ventilator and succeed. Well, you could say, okay, this is simple, so this is not a problem. No, at the opposite. This is a big problem. Because the big question for you, clinicians in the ICU, is to be sure that you detect this patient as early as possible. And in fact, this is where a lot of progress has been made. To have a systematic detection of the time at which the patients are ready. And this is where maybe by just saving one day of ventilation, but saving that for 80% of your patient, it saves a lot of ICU days. So it's not a medical problem per se, it's a, a problem of the process you have in your ICU. Then you have a second group, and we called it the difficult twinning. Uh, this patient failed the first attempt, and maybe they need uh, two, three, up to one week repeating the attempts, uh, the spontaneous breathing trial, to be separated from the ventilator. And in this patient, this, this is a medical question. And the medical question is, why do they pa these patients fail? And we will see that there is a relatively limited list. It's always the main reasons, uh, the, main, the same main reasons. And then you have a third group. And this third group is different again. Uh, it's called prolonged winning. And I, I don't know if it's a, a very good term, but after one week, they are still connected to the ventilator. They become ventilator dependent. And in these patients who usually have underlying cardiac or respiratory insufficiency, uh, this is the patient you see for days and weeks in the ICU. The, the overall problem is not so much the ventilation, it's really the general management of these patients. The nutrition, the, um, the, the sleep, the, the mood disorder, the uh, mobilization, of course, uh, so, so it's really the global management. And why is it interesting to have uh, this in mind? Because the problems are very, very different. For instance, you may have heard that some people discuss the, how long should be a spontaneous breathing trial, right? Should it be 30 minutes, one hour, two hours? Well, for, for group three, these patients with prolonged winning who are tracheostomized, it does, this question does not make sense. Because for these patients, what you want is that uh, they sustain two days or three days or five days without a ventilator to be sure that they win. So the question for the group one I, I, has absolutely no sense for group three. I hope I'm clear. But this is important because sometimes the, the guidelines for winning the recommendation, they put everybody in the same bag, whereas the approach is clearly very different in the three groups. Okay, very important. Uh, there have been a, a few studies looking at this uh, classification in three groups. Uh, and, and these studies are questionable because some are short, uh, uh, are single center, so it depends on the case mix. Uh, overall, the result is that the group one is the biggest group, uh, and the group three, so the, the prolonged winning, have the uh, worst outcome, the, the higher mortality. However, these studies use the classification uh, 
per se, which is a classification for patients who are weaned from the ventilator. However, there are also many patients who cannot be weaned. And uh, for this reason, we uh, thought that this classification should be uh, reshaped to include every patient. And I'm going to briefly show you uh, a study that we uh, performed in, in France with a few European centers. So it was the new definition of uh, winning outcome uh, called the WIN study. Uh, we include almost uh, 3,000 patients. And to make things very simple, we say, let's look at patients for whom winning is terminated after one day, between one day and one week, and one week or more, okay, to make it very simple. And in fact, we took every patient. So we took patients who succeeded, but also patients who failed. So the first result, and this is the, the largest study uh, uh, looking at, at winning, is that the group one, so patients who have winning terminated within one day, it's by far the larger group. It's, it's above 70% of the patients. Uh, and remember, this is not because it's simple that there is no problem, right? If, if, you, if you prolong the duration of mechanical ventilation for these patients, you will, uh, because it's 70% of patients in the ICU, uh, this will uh, occupy a, a large number of beds. Group two and group three were approximately 15% each. These three groups were very different. The mortality in the first group is uh, very, very low. Most patients will survive the hospital stay, so it's 6% of hospital mortality. For group two, those who need uh, up to one week, the mortality is uh, three times higher, 17%. And for group three, the mortality is close to ARDS, right, 30%. So very different group, very different outcome, morbidity, mortality, length of stay, etc. cetera, it, it differs a lot. So if you look at the uh, daily probability of mortality, for instance, after the first failure of being separated from the ventilator, well, you see that uh, every day the patient is not separated, the, probability of death increase. And you see that those patients still at day 10, the mortality is now close to 40%. So being stuck on the ventilator in the ICU is, is, uh, is not a good thing. So the recommendation usually about uh, winning, um, I think uh, insist a lot on the approach for the group one patients. And this approach is based uh, on this seminal study by Wes Eli, who said, uh, well, let's compare an intervention to a control uh, approach. And this intervention will be a daily screening of very simple criteria to say, well, maybe we should try to see if the patient is capable of breathing spontaneously. So look at the title of the study. It's identifying patients capable of breathing spontaneously and the impact on the duration of mechanical ventilation. So the daily screening was, uh, is oxygenation okay, PF above 200? Is the PEEP low, no more than five? Is the patient able to cough? Very simple, it was just cough when you suction the patient. Is the uh, rapid shallow breathing index below 100? And we'll come back to that because this is probably the most complex aspect of this uh, protocol. Is the patient off vasopressor and sedative? So this is supposed to be uh, checked in a few minutes. And when the patients were checked for all these criteria, they were submitted to a two-hour trial of spontaneous breathing. 
Of course, when we say two hours, it's a maximum of two hours, right? If a patient fails after five minutes, you don't let the patient for two hours, but they went to two hours. And then when the patient passed the test, the physician in charge was notified saying your patient passed the spontaneous breathing trial. So this patient has an 85% chance of being extubated successfully. And with this approach, they considerably reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation compared to their control approach. Uh, and there was no more complication, no reintubation, for instance. So this is really the basis for all actual recommendation. You need to do a very simple screening every day. Interestingly, the uh, control group in that study was mostly using SIMV. And you, you may remember that in the two trials I, I've shown, our trial and the trial from Esteban, SIMV was the worst technique. Everybody's familiar with what is SIMV, right? Yeah. SIMV is a, it's, it's a mandatory mechanical breast, and in between you have spontaneous breathing with or without pressure support. And let me show you just one study to illustrate why SIM, SIMV failed to shorten the duration of mechanical ventilation. I don't think SIMV is bad in itself. But, so this, this was a very nice physiological study. And you see the mandatory breast, this is airway pressure, and the spontaneous breast. At that time, there was no pressure support during spontaneous breast. So they are very different, right? The mandatory breast, spontaneous breast. So, physicians uh, were thinking, well, the patient is doing half of the work. Half is done by the ventilator, half is done by the patient, right? Well, this is completely wrong. When you look at what the patient is doing, and remember, a patient is simply breathing. So the patient was breathing. You see that the esophageal pressure swings were exactly the same whether it was the mandatory breast or the spontaneous breast. Same for EMG of the sterno of, or the diaphragm. So probably the main characteristic of this mode, and this is not unique to SIMV, is that the clinician has no idea of what the patient is really doing. Okay? You, you're, you're manipulating the, the breast given by the ventilator, but the patient is breathing, and you don't know whether the patient is capable or not of breathing spontaneously. That's why you need to take the patient off the vent and do a spontaneous breathing trial. You're not convinced? Let me show you another example. This is a very sophisticated study of respiratory mechanics. And I love respiratory mechanics, but here they say, let's measure resistance, compliance, elastance, intrinsic PEEP, the lung, the chest wall, and let's see if we can predict who is going to fail, who is going to succeed. And the answer was very simple. There was no difference. You cannot predict who is going to fail or to succeed. So the only way to know if a patient is ready to be separated from the vent is to separate the patient from the vent. Okay? The, the, this looks simple, but it, it, it took a long time to realize. So this is why the philosophy of winning is do a very simple daily assessment, very simple criteria, and then just look at whether the patient is ready or not. Okay? One uh, important question is about the rapid shallow breathing index. Who is measuring the rapid shallow breathing index in uh, his or her ICU? One, two, three, four. Okay, five. 
There has been a lot of controversy about this test. This test is based on this observation, which is absolutely brilliant. And this observation is the respiratory rate and the tidal volume for a patient who is disconnected from the ventilator. And you see that this is during mechanical ventilation. This is after disconnection. The respiratory rate is high. The tidal volume is low. This is what we call a, a rapid, shallow breathing. Okay, rapid, high frequency, shallow, small tidal volume. And these patients at 20 minutes looks in distress. At two minutes, the patient does not look in distress. But if you measure the rate and the volume, you see that it's already very abnormal. Okay? So what is absolutely unique here is that the information about the fact that the patient will be in distress in 30 minutes, you can get this information at two minutes after disconnection by measuring the rate and the tidal volume and calculating the ratio called the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. Very interesting. However, this is useful only if you do it very early, at a time where you have no idea whether the patient is ready or not. Okay? So your patient has been uh, on the vent for weeks and has been septic and, and now you think he may be ready, but you have no idea. You do the test, the test is not so bad, you say, oh, okay, let's go for a spontaneous breathing trial. If you do the test when you're 99% sure that your patient is ready for extubation, this is a waste of time. And you may even have false negative result of the test. And this is why there, is, there has been a long controversy because some patient, this is the, all the studies which use this test. This is the initial study and you see that this is the, the rate of success of the patient. It was close to 50% in the initial studies, which means that the patient was tested very early, where really you, it's a 50-50% chance that the patient will do it or not, okay? But there have been a number of studies, like all these studies, where the patients were successful at 90-95%. The test then is completely useless. So the only interest of the test is to do it early and to try to detect some patients where the F over of it is, is normal. So, so you, can, you can proceed to a, a spontaneous breathing trial. Is that okay? I do think it's, a, it's an interesting test, but again, do it early. Uh, I'm going to be very late, uh, Mr. Chairman. No, I go, I, I go quickly. So these are very important points. What are the main medical issues which explain that some patients fail? So let's say group two patients. I will go quickly. The first one is sedation. Again, it's not a medical problem, it's a problem of how we manage sedation. We can talk about sedation for hours or days. I don't think we have a solution, uh, an easy solution yet. This is a study which uh, tested the spontaneous awakening trial, which is daily interruption of sedation plus spontaneous breathing trial associated. So when they did this approach to decrease the amount of sedation given to the patient, they found that the patient were separated earlier. But in addition, that the one at one year, the survival was better. This is incredible. So sedation, if you don't manage your patients correctly, you will, you will, uh, this will have an enormous impact on winning. And again, I don't think we have easy solution. The, the number one medical problem is probably weaning-induced pulmonary edema. 
This is the seminal study by François Lemaire, who showed that patients disconnected from the vent had huge uh, intrathoracic, uh, negative intrathoracic pressure swings, which generated an, uh, um, um, a big afterload on the left ventricle, and at the same time, which m massively increased venous return, and these patients were developing pulmonary edema. Uh, is it important? It's very important because it has an impact which you can treat, okay? This is a study which is a proof of concept. We manage winning based on measurement of BNP. Why BNP? Because we think it's not, it's not so much the cardiac function which matters. The cardiac function is important. But it's, it's uh, the fluid overload. That's the most important problem. Okay, so maybe if patients have normal systolic function but fluid overload, they may develop pulmonary edema. And we showed in this study that basi ba uh, uh, um, managing the weaning based on measurement of BNP, we gave more Lasix, we make the, made the patients more negative, and this had a significant impact on the duration of weaning. So I'm not saying you should do that in every patient, I'm saying this is something very important. Every time you have a patient who is uh, hypoxemic, hypertensive, tachycardic, you should think about it and probably even prevent it by giving uh, uh, diuretics before. The next issue, I'm uh, going to go very fast, uh, is diaphragm weakness. Diaphragm weakness is probably the number two problem explaining uh, winning difficulties. This is a study done by Martin Dress where he tested the diaphragm force by using phrenic nerve si uh, stimulation. And one of the questions in this study was, is diaphragm weakness the same thing that uh, limb muscle weakness, you know, what we call ICU neuropolymyopathy, right? And so he compared the phrenic nerve stimulation to the MRC score. And when the phrenic nerve stimulation give a pressure which is less than 11 centimeters of water, it's a sign of diaphragm weakness. Uh, the first surprise was at the time of winning, 63% of patients had diaphragm dysfunction. And this has been found in other studies. So diaphragm weakness and dysfunction is very frequent. It doesn't mean when you have diaphragm dysfunction that you cannot be weaned, but it means that if you have diaphragm dysfunction plus anything else, a bit of fluid overload, a bit of sepsis, a bit of, I don't know, it will make weaning very difficult and they found indeed that uh, diaphragm dysfunction was associated with difficult winning and prolonged winning, much more than limb muscle weakness. So this is the problem number two, or number three, sedation, um, uh, pulmonary edema, and, uh, and respiratory muscle weakness. I will just finish with that which is what is the best spontaneous breathing trial test? This is a difficult question. You just have to know that from a physiological standpoint, the best technique, no question about that, is no support. Just breathing through the tube with a T-piece. This is the best way to mimic what the patient will do after extubation. This is a study where we measure the work of breathing during the TPs and after extubation. You see the resistive work is exactly the same after extubation. There is no imposed load due to the tube and we recently uh, did a, a, a systematic review and a meta-analysis of all these studies which, which made this measurement. Every time you put some pressure support or some CPAP, you assist the patient. So you, in fact, underestimate what the patient will do. So doing a TPS or during zero zero on the ventilator seems to be the most phys the, the the best uh, physiological approach. 
From the clinical standpoint, what's the best approach? I don't know because it may be that uh, many clinicians are reluctant to extubate their patient. And maybe having uh, an approach which is uh, underestimating a little bit the work of breathing, uh, maybe it compensates for this clinical reluctance. But me as a clinician, when I have a difficult patient, I want to be sure that extubation will not be a catastrophe, and I do a TP, so a zero, zero on the ventilator, and uh, the decision to extubate, as uh, we said with Arno, is a very important decision, and again, for the, for the difficult patients, that's why we cannot put everybody in the same bag, I think the best test is without support. I will stop there and be happy to answer any short question. Thank you. Yes, one short question, please.